Well, thanks very much. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about gene editing, and uh, I guess I was a little disappointed yesterday at our strategy section when we were talk session when we were talking about the next 10 years that we didn't have some topics coming up for the future like gene editing. So uh, I first got exposed to gene editing when a colleague of mine who worked for the Medical College in Wisconsin got an NIH grant to gene edit hundreds of genes in rodents. He had to target all of the genes that were active in the brain of rodents to try and work out what those genes did. So there's a technology that's been around for a little while, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about conventional selection so you understand what the difference is, a little bit about GMO, uh, describe gene editing, and then talk about some new and then one or two other non-biological issues. So conventional pedigree prediction, or even single-step prediction, we are interested in knowing what the breeding value of a sire is. And here, this is a Brayford bull with some offspring. Um, that, that bull, you might look at that bull and you might like the look of him or not like the look of him, but um, I'm not at all interested in what he looks like. That's just an envelope containing his DNA. What I'm interested in is what his offspring look like. So I'm interested in the envelopes of his offspring that are produced as a result of his DNA being transmitted to the next generation. And <clears throat> when we do an evaluation, whether it's with pedigree information or with genomic information, we basically take the raw phenotypes of all of those offspring, we adjust for non-genetic effects like uh, rearing rank and herd year and sex and so on, age of dam, and uh, we get a whole lot of deviations, and then those deviations we somehow pull. Uh, there I show you an example where the average of those deviations are, say, 10 kilos. If that was based on thousands of offspring, then the EBV of the bull would be 20 kilos, because only half of his pairs of chromosomes are represented in his offspring, so he must have twice the superiority you see in his offspring. But mostly they don't have, an, have a huge number of offspring, and so we have to shrink what we see. And, and you hear about this BLUP technology, and basically what it is, it's a shrinkage system. So we shrink, instead of being 20 kilos, we shrink it a little bit, and we'd say that bull, based on, say, 85 offspring, averaging 10 kilos, would have an EBV of, say, 16 to 18 kilos. So that is a very blunt instrument for selection, and I'll try and explain why that is. So here I'm showing you three bulls, or a small fraction of the genomes of three bulls. And, uh, and there's a yellow strand and an orange strand. That represents a small piece of the chromosome that came from the father of the bull. And let's say the orange one is a small piece of the chromosome that came from the mother of the bull. And if we're talking about cattle, they'll have 30 pairs of chromosomes. Sheep are going to have 27 pairs of chromosomes. And those chromosomes are a sequence of about 100 million base pairs. The whole genome contains about 20,000 genes. So there's little, little under 1,000 genes on each of those chromosomes. And I've shown a few there in blue um, representing genes. And then the area between the genes, we often refer to as being mostly junk. The genes only comprise about 1.5% of the genome. So mutations occur every time a chromosome is copied, and those mutations get passed on often to the next generation. And if we were to look at, say, the, the genomes of cattle, we would find across breeds 30, 40, 50, 60 million different mutations in cattle. Within your herd of cattle on your property, it's probably more like, uh, you know, perhaps five to 10 million. Numbers in sheep are probably similar. So one of the things you'll notice is that on, on one of those uh, strands of, uh, of chromosome, we've got some positive effects and we've got some negative effects due to those mutations. So most of those mutations are very, very ancient. But there are also new mutations that occur every time a chromosome is copied. And there's roughly one of those that occurs on every chromosome, every meiosis. So if we've got 30 pairs of chromosomes, 60 chromosomes in cattle, every time you have a new calf born, it would have something like 60 new mutations 
that weren't present in its parents. And if you multiply 60 new mutations times, say, 5 million, 6 million calves born a year, you're talking about a huge number of mutations. Similarly in sheep, you talk about, say, 20, 25 million lambs being born, uh, 54 chromosomes, a huge number of new mutations that occur. Now, many of those mutations never get passed on to the offspring because the, because the individual doesn't get used as a parent. And there's actually a balance between the number of old mutations and new mutations. So every generation we lose about as many mutations as we gain. So the number of mutations stays pretty much constant. Okay, and one of the things you'll notice is that even a, a below average individual will have some uh, above average alleles and a, and a really good individual will have some not so good alleles. So when you look at a selection list or you look at an EBV from a progeny test, you're looking at that number on the right, but in actual fact that number on the right is due to summing up all of the effects of all of the genes that affect that particular trait. And I've just shown you a small piece of one chromosome, but it could be hundreds of genes affecting a particular trait that you're interested in. Okay, <coughs> so uh, Steve talked yesterday about, uh, about sharing of, uh, of chromosome fragments. This is one that's of a little more interest to me. Um, the, this, is, this is my daughter compared on the left-hand side to my father and on the right-hand side compared to my mother-in-law. And so those little blue fragments show the pieces that of the genome, say, on the left-hand side that my father has that are shared by my daughter. So if I was to look at my daughter's genome compared to mine, it would be a bit boring because she would have inherited one chromosome from each of my peers, so everything would look like a blue line. But when you go back another generation, say, to the grandparent, grand offspring, on average we know that relationship is a quarter. But if you look at that, at that chromosome sharing, particularly with my father, some of the chromosomes, my daughter doesn't share anything with my father, and some of those chromosomes, she shares everything with my father. So if you just go back to the idea that along one of those chromosomes, there are a whole lot of effects that influence a trait, some positive and some negative, she's missed out on any good things my father had on chromosome 14 or chromosome 15 or chromosome 19. And she's got all the things that, that he had on, on one of his copies of chromosome 8 and chromosome 10 and chromosome 17 and chromosome 18, which would have included good things and bad things. So if you imagine having four grandparents, what you'd really want to do is pick the eyes out of all of the good things that they had and put them together into one of those grand offspring. But it's very hard to pick the eyes out of them when these chromosomes get inherited in these very, very big chunks. So on average, one chromosome has one recombination event, each meiosis, which means a chromosome that you pass on to your offspring generally is a mixture of the one you got from the father and one you got from the mother. So by the time you go to a second generation, you tend to get two recombinations, which is what you see there, where there's a blue strand, which is shared in common, and then a, a white strand, which is not. Okay? So uh, selection on progeny test or genomic EBVs is very, very crude because we're just ranking them on the whole merit over that, uh, over that whole chromosome or over the whole genome. And what we'd really like to be able to do is just pick out the good bits and very quickly put them together in an offspring. So one way to do this was worked out some time ago um, using what at the time was known as a genetically modified organism. And it was pretty crude. It was just where you would cut out a big chunk of DNA that you thought had some favorable effect in it. And after it was cut out, then it would be copied, and the technical term for that is cloning it. And then that cloned material would be pasted back in to the genome. And it was often pasted back in very, very crudely. Um, if that piece that has been cut out comes from the same species, then we would normally talk about it being isogenic whereas if it comes from another species, we would talk about it being transgenic. So you've probably heard, for example, where the gene that, that uh, causes Roundup resistance was cut out and pasted into some other crop. So that was a transgenic GMO, but we also have isogenic GMOs. Now, I didn't realize how 
primitive this was until I vis visited the maize breeding program at Pioneer in Des Moines one year. And there were all these people sitting down in front of an instrument, and every now and then there'd be a loud noise. And they were taking a blank 22 cartridge, and they were loading it into the top of this machine. And then under that, they were putting a little dish that had a lot of these cloned genes. And they were cloned genes that had been copied out of some other maize family. And joined to that copy was a Roundup resistant gene. And when they fired the blank, it would actually shoot that material through a little sieve and blast it into embryos. So there was no control of where in the genome it went, no control of, where, of how many copies of it went into the genome. But they would then start to grow those young plants and they would spray them with Roundup and everything that died had not been transgenically modified. Everything that survived had been modified. And what they then wanted to know was did that fragment they put in there have a positive effect across all those different families and lines? And if it did, they would then go back and they would conventionally introgress that material in. So, so GMO technology has been used for a long time to improve all kinds of organisms, not necessarily to the marketplace, but just to work out which of the fragments are good and to work out which ones you want to put into future individuals. So gene editing is very, very different from those classical methods of creating GMOs. It's much more like a search and replace on a word processor, where you take a particular sequence of those 100 million base pairs, a fragment of them that exist in the genome, and you search for it and you try and replace uh, one or more elements of them. It can be done very, very precisely, and there are a number of different approaches available. The first one that became widely available was known as zinc fingers, and then not long after that, a new methodology called talons was invented, and then the most recent one you hear a lot about is called CRISPR-Cas9, and I've given you there what that acronym stands for. Uh, Cas9 is just one particular enzyme that can be used for CRISPR and there are other enzymes around and there will probably be a lot more new methodologies that come over the next little while. But if you do a Google search for CRISPR Cas9 as I did yesterday, there are over 3 million hits of it on Google. So there's an awful lot of work being done on this CRISPR Cas9 system. So how is it done? You have to take that strand of a genome and you have to know the sequence that you're interested in changing and that's quite possibly a gene that you want to change, so you need to know that target sequence, so you have to have done some next generation sequencing. And that target sequence needs to be large enough so that it's unique. If you only have a small sequence, then it will occur in lots of different parts of the genome, so you have to make it big enough so that it is uh, unique to just one particular location. And then you introduce something called guide RNA, and guide RNA is complementary, so it, it joins up and attaches to the genome at that position where you wanted to make a change. And then you also add uh, this Cas9 enzyme, if you're using the CRISPR-Cas9 methodology, and it binds to the, to the guide RNA at that particular piece of the genome. And this is a system that was discovered in bacteria that was used to, um, to, to disable invading pathogens like viruses. And so what the Cas9 enzyme does is cuts the DNA to stop it from working. So a bacteria could cut viral DNA to stop it from working. So this is a natural system, if you like. So what it does is it cuts the genome right at that point, corresponding to your guide RNA. And then your cell says, oh, this is a problem. We've got a breakage in the DNA and we need to repair it. So it gets repaired and it gets broken and it gets repaired and it gets broken. And it can be encouraged when it's repaired to make a small modification to it, perhaps to drop out a base or to add another base or to add a few more bases. So you can take a gene and break it, which would be called a knockout, or you could take something else and you could introduce a gene into it, which would be called a knock-in. And once it's done, it's impossible to tell that the gene edit has occurred. You can't tell 
that that wasn't a natural mutation like those natural mutations that occur in every chromosome, every meiosis, that occur more than a billion times a year in the New Zealand industry when we look at the number of lambs and calves that are born. Okay? So that means it's really unenforceable. So if you think about, um, say, the speed limit, if you put a speed limit sign up, that's enforceable because there are systems like radars that can be used to tell how fast you're going. But how would you enforce a speed limit if there was no way to tell how fast a car was going? So if I show you some DNA and I say this is a really good ram or a really good bull, you can't tell if that naturally occurred in my flock or my herd or if it was done by gene editing. Okay, so um, there's some of the early press, um, you'll hear that it was a hard technology to do because you could only do one gene at a time and there were a lot of off-target hits, so you would change parts of the genome you didn't want to change. Um, but there's a lot of new stuff coming in May 22nd in Nature Biotechnology, this group at Harvard said um, in yeast they've developed a high throughput system where they can alter hundreds of different genes in the, in the exact same um, meiosis, right? So they can go in and that one operation, they're not just making one gene edit, they can make hundreds of gene edits with 80 to 100 percent efficiency. Now there is another amazing technology that is a little bit more scary and is not one that is quite so much interest to us right now and that's called a gene drive. And on a gene drive, the guide RNA and that Cas9 enzyme is introduced into the host genome. So the gene edit machinery is passed on to the offspring. So on the left there I show you some normal inheritance where there's a, a red fly, which is a, uh, a heterozygous, and it has some offspring which inherit the, the, the red allele and some inherit the blue allele, and on it transmits down through subsequent generations. But with a gene drive, it changes the laws of inheritance so that when an individual uh, inherits one mutant allele, the gene edit machinery actually changes the other allele it inherited from the other parent to make it homozygous. So instead of the offspring being, being heterozygous, all of the offspring are being homozygous. So this gets passed on and on and gets driven through the population. And this is being used in, uh, in flies, for instance, and mosquitoes to try and get rid of mosquitoes. You can have a modification that will make mosquitoes, for instance, only have male offspring and their offspring will only have male offspring and it can completely drive through and uh, reduce the size of the population quite quickly. So uh, I want to give you a few examples of some use cases or some places where gene editing would be of interest and, and LIC has been very, very keen to do gene editing for quite a number of years and, uh, and one of the reasons that they're interested in gene editing is because to do things with conventional breeding just takes way too long. So some of the kinds of targets that we might be interested in doing is changing, changing a horned breed like Holstein's to a polled breed. And you could easily do that by crossing a Holstein to a polled breed, but the offspring would only be half Holstein. So then the next generation, you could back cross them again to Holstein and select for the pole gene, but they would only be three quarter Holstein. And then the next generation, they would be seven eighths. And the, the effect of that other genome that you brought the polled gene from would suppress the BW so much that those animals would not be competitive for dairy farmers to use. So it takes too long and it uh, depresses your overall index values. Normal hair versus slick coat. So Senapol cattle have a mutation that gives them a slick coat, which means they do much better in hot environments. And there are a number of groups all around the world, including a couple in New Zealand, that are trying to integress the slick coat into Holsteins to use those in tropical environments, which is where a lot of the dairy cattle production worldwide needs to be. And again, this takes a long time. It's going to take five to ten years to generate an animal which is mostly Holstein and has that slick coat. And ideally, if you were doing it, you'd probably want to bring pole in at the same time. 
Uh, coat color is another one people sometimes want to change. Normal muscle versus double muscle. We have the myostatin mutation, wool versus hair. Uh, dominant color patterns. Dairy farmers want to know if a calf is born to, uh, to a sire that, that you don't want the, the daughter kept as a replacement. And so there are examples like the speckle park and the belted galloway that are dominant mutations. Whereas if you use an Angus sire, it's hard to tell the difference whether the calf is actually an Angus cross or a Holstein cross. So lots of these things would be really, really good targets for gene editing. And in some jurisdictions in the world, they would argue that what you are generating with this technology is, is no different than what could be done by classical mating and introgression. Right? So this is an isogenic kind of change and therefore that will not be considered to be genetically modified. And my understanding is both Canada and Australia are, are looking at the legislation in that view. So gene editing for these kinds of changes that could have been done from conventional crossing and introgressing would not be a genetic modification, which means those animals could go into the food chain, which means that semen from those animals could be exported to other countries. And there is no way a country like New Zealand could demonstrate whether those animals had or had not been gene edited. Because unlike the conventional GMO where they shoot in the gene, you don't have the remnants lying behind that show you that it's been gene edited. The second use case that is very interesting is for uh, getting rid of carriers of deleterious alleles. So virtually every human and every ram and every bull will have deleterious alleles. And uh, mostly they are at very, very low frequency, which means the deleterious mutations that are in one of your rams and in one of your ewes are different sets, and the offspring will inherit half of the ones the sire had and half of the ones that the dam had. Uh, and you will never see those things unless you start to do some inbreeding, and even then you see them. But they can quite uh, quickly become common whenever you widely use a sire. So in the dairy industry, when a bull gets 100,000 daughters, then even a rare mutation, a de novo mutation that that bull had which his parents did not have, is instantly spread through 50,000 of his daughters perhaps in the population. And then a, a generation or two later, if you use, say, a, a son or a grandson that carries that mutation, then suddenly you'll see this condition. And over the years, there are many conditions like that we have uh, internationally discovered in cattle. And there's a number there. Those are four that we have discovered in New Zealand with sheep. And one thing that really disturbs me is that when we find these things, it's always been when a commercial farmer has called up the vet school and we've said, have we got a strange looking animal. I have never found one of these where a ram breeder has called me up and said, we've got an issue. It always comes from a commercial farmer. But in the dairy industry, we hear straight away from farmers. And often within a few weeks, we can find the region of the genome, the fragment that contains that bad effect. And often we can very quickly from that find the mutation itself. So some of those deleterious alleles are embryonically lethal, and they are really, really easy to find, because when you have an embryonic lethal, then when you genotype the offspring, you'll find there are none that are homozygous in that particular position. So if there is a common fragment throughout the industry, you would expect it's very common for a sire and a dam both to be carrying that, then you should see offspring that are homozygous but you've got to look for them. So here are some recent publications in cattle from a few people that have looked, from, looked for them. So there are 30 that have been published in recent days from, from just a handful of publications that are embryonically lethal. This all comes from, uh, from dairy populations. But I imagine there are similar numbers out there in sheep. It's a bit harder to for you to see them in sheep, it would just cause a partial failure of a multiple ovulation. So if you have a carrier sire and a carrier dam, then one in four of the offspring would be embryonically lethal. And if you've got twins or triplet ovulation, then you wouldn't notice that effect perhaps. But we know they're out there. They're also out there for lots of other traits. They're a little more difficult to find for other traits, but we are finding a lot in other traits, particularly in dairy cattle.
Um, okay, so the classical approach to deal with recessives is to test for the mutation and often to get rid of the individual that carries that mutation. And that's a really, really bad thing to do because if you do that, it grossly reduces your selection intensity. It's far better to use the individuals that are elite, even though they carry an unfavorable mutation, and test the offspring and make sure that only clear offspring that are males, say, are used widely in the next generation. And there's a lot of interest in the dairy industry in genotyping every cow so that you can make sure when you choose who you're gonna mate that cow to, that, uh, that you avoid a mating where the cow and the bull carry the same uh, recessive mutation. It's okay to mate them to different uh, combinations. There's also interest in gene effects for complex traits. So we know there's lots of major genes for ovulation rate in, ch in sheep and we might be interested in stacking those, and by stacking we mean grabbing all of those good ones and putting them together in, a, in the same individual. Um, sexual precocity is another example. We know that, um, that hogget fertility is something we could improve. We know that age at puberty in cattle has a huge impact on lifetime reproductive success. We know there are some major genes that affect those traits. Uh, body size in sheep and cattle is a problem. Uh, most people don't put enough emphasis on maternal traits. They try and think that they can do selection for, for one size that will fit all, and they tend to put more emphasis on terminal rather than maternal. If we could control some of these things, we could gene edit and make better maternal lines that had smaller body size and, and smaller intakes. There's milk composition examples. AgriSearch has done quite a bit of work knocking out BLG, or beta-lactoglobulin, which is a uh, a compound in milk. It's a whey protein that is, um, is, is causes allergenic issues. Um, there was another, another really interesting mutation we found some years ago. We call it the Marge mutation. It comes from a cow that, that we called Marge. And this was a cow that um, had milk composition that was more than six standard deviations from the mean. So we screen, screened the national database, found unusual cows, brought them together, and this particular cow, when you made butter from her milk, it spread straight out of the refrigerator like margarine. That's why she was called Marge. And it turned out that she had a uh, novel mutation in a gene that has a huge effect on milk composition called DGAT, but it was not the common mutation that was known about already. It was a different one. And uh, this, is a, this is a mutation which... Um, loads the third fatty acid onto a triglyceride molecule. And this particular Marge mutation had a, a broken gene or a knockout version of that gene. And unfortunately, if you had a homozygous version of it, then it wasn't able to produce any triglycerides and basically became a lethal condition. And sadly, Fonterra decided the risk of negative publicity uh, was too great if a carrier cow was ever mated to a carrier bull. So they uh, terminated a large experiment that we had trying to produce uh, 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 butter from milk that would allow us to pull it out of the refrigerator and easily spread it. But it would be really nice to make a modification to that DGAT mutation, which was not quite as serious as the Marge mutation, so that an individual was homozygous for it would still live. Uh, but that would be a new mutation. It's not one that already exists that we know of. It would be one that we've invented by knowing what we know about those traits. Mean fibrolimeter in sheep, increased secondary primary ratio, reduced micron without merino negatives. That would be nice. Some of you have tried to cross merinos with your animals and reduce the fiber diameter. And the unfortunate thing is you bring in a lot of negative issues from other parts of the merino genome that it's very hard for you to get rid of. We wouldn't have those same problems with gene editing. Um, there are also a lot of ideas from other species. Uh, one of those is manipulating the sex ratio. So there is a group at University of California in Davis who are trying to put the SRY gene, which is involved in, in creating a male offspring, they're gonna take that off the Y chromosome and put it onto the X chromosome so they can have offspring that have a, a sex ratio more skewed toward male for beef. 
It was already done some years ago where they took a similar gene in mice and they put it on one of the autosomes so they could have mice that had a, a three-quarter to one-quarter ratio of males to females. Sheep, taillessness. So in, uh, in China, they crossed a fat tail sheep with a normal sheep and they mapped the gene responsible for the fat tail. Then they looked at the literature in humans and other species and discovered that that particular gene was responsible for taillessness. So they did a gene edit on those sheep and they produced tailless sheep all in the space of less than a year. So they already exist. A seasonality is another one. Four versus two memory glands. That would be a nice one to change. We know there are species with four memory glands, quarters like cows. It would be nice if we could have, uh, have sheep that had four quarters rather than just two halves, if we were interested in pushing the triplet thing. Uh, deer, it would be nice to have deer that didn't produce antlers. So for venison production, we didn't have to go to all the hassle of knocking them off. Uh, lots of other examples where we could block mechanisms used by disease organis organisms to become established. And I, one I just mentioned is the bottom one there, the CD163 cell receptors. So PERS is porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. It's caused by a virus and it's devastating when it hits your herd if your herd is naive to it. And some, uh, some researchers worked out the way in which that virus entered the cell. And once it enters the cell, it hijacks the, the DNA replication mechanisms and gets the cell to replicate the virus. So they just knocked out that receptor that allowed the virus to get in. And once they did that in all other respects, everything else about the genome of that pig looked perfectly normal, but the virus could not get into the cell could not be replicated and would not spread through the herd. So PIC are very interested in marketing a pig like that. We don't have the PERS virus in New Zealand yet, but it is in many other parts of the world. It would also be really nice to change feed sources. So one of the big problems we have in New Zealand with ryegrass is the protein content of ryegrass is much more than the requirements for the animal. And if the animal is not using all of the protein that is in that feed relative to the amount of energy that's in it, it gets converted to urea and then it gets excreted. And so a lot of the nitrate problem that you're hearing about in our catchments could be, could be grossly reduced if we could either supplement those animals with an energy source like PKE or maize silage or perhaps gene edit the grass to produce produce low, less protein from the beginning. And there are many others, increasing the digestibility, altering seasonality, suppressing toxin production. So in maize, they have discovered that there are genes in maize that control the toxicity of fungal infections of the maize. So we could perhaps gene edit ryegrass so that Pythomyces produces less sporodesmin. We know that there are strains of Pythomyces and other parts of the world that don't produce facial eczema. Endophyte transmission is another issue. Endophytes are very important to high producing ryegrass in New Zealand and the breeders have an a, a enormous problem in getting endophyte established and there is a sort of a community relationship between the endophyte and the ryegrass. Some cultivars, they can't get the endophyte in very easily. Some endophytes produce toxins that cause things like ryegrass staggers. So gene editing and endophytes would be really good, as would some of the other tenants. Another thing that would be interesting to do is prove causality. So often we find genes where we think this gene is causing some phenotype, but it's very hard to show it exhaustively. And I applied for a large NIH grant several years ago in the US to try and do this for a bunch of known uh, gene effects that we, we had uh, looked at in cattle. Uh, unfortunately, the, because it was a human health uh, area, they said they would have funded the research if I'd done it in pigs, but they wouldn't fund it if we did it in cattle. But we are very, very interested in, in using this technology whenever we found a potential causal mutation, just to see if that is the one that's actually causing the disease, because then it would be very easy for, to test for it and show, exhaust, show exhaustively that we have the right mutation. 
Gene therapy is another one. So for instance, in, in, in gene therapy here, we're not talking about modification the individual so its offspring are different. We're talking about modifying the individual so it performs better in its own life. And they have demonstrated that they can use a CRISPR mutation to reduce autism symptoms in mice. Uh, and then there's been another one to show that they can uh, modify mice that would otherwise become blind in their own lifetime. And, uh, and this is a condition that occurs in humans, something like one in 4,000 people. So, so gene editing is gonna, is gonna be uh, quite commonplace in human for a whole kind of, of therapeutic regions, reasons. And uh, you don't have to think very long, but there are many, many other things we could gene edit. Rumen microbes, soil microbes. Uh, we have a problem with cadmium and zinc levels in some of our uh, New Zealand soils, and if we could make some modifications to somehow gobble those up or immobilize them, to digest effluent, to break down plastics. Uh, beer, wine, and spirits, it's used to modify the yeasts and then cheese, the fermentation bacteria, or the fungi and blue cheese. And then in related industries, there are many, many other areas where there is interest. So plant and food is very keen to do these kinds of things for kiwi fruit. We heard about kiwi fruit at the opening address, and it was just very, very fortuitous that there happened to be a PSA resistant variety that actually had commercial opportunities. Uh, plant and food research would really like to make some other modifications, but uh, right now Zespri is concerned. Um, about the trade implications. Pinus radiata, there's a bunch of diseases there that, uh, that could be quite devastating. You probably heard about issues with, uh, with the rata, Pahutakawa and Manuka. Rata have been taken out on Raoul Island from the Myrtle Rust, so the southern rata is probably uh, going to be badly affected by Myrtle Rust, and if we didn't do something like gene editing, we might lose those from a lot of our areas. So what are the pros? Um, Hopefully, by now, you realise there's all kinds of really neat things we could do with it. Uh, we could improve the welfare of the animals. Uh, we could improve animal health. We could also improve human healthfulness uh, of the meat. We could make better meat, for instance, with higher mineral con concentrations. Uh, we could reduce the environmental hoof print. We could have more efficient production, and all of those things would give us happier consumers. What are the cons? The real big con is the possible negative public perception. And, uh, and we have the issue about whether an uninformed public will decide what is best for New Zealand agriculture. And I just want to show you a here that uh, scared me a little bit when I saw this recently. This is showing the per capita consumption in New Zealand of beef and sheep over the last 10 years. And the average consumption of sheep meat in New Zealand, this is in carcass weight equivalents, is only 6.3 kilos of carcass. And since probably about half of that is bone, the average New Zealander is now only eating about three kilos of lamb meat. And part of the reason for that is, uh, is because of the retail price increase for uh, for beef and sheep relative to what has happened in pork and poultry. There is also the aspect that we've had a 41% increase in the domestic population during that time, so this might not totally be reflecting Kiwis that have been born and bred here eating less. It might be partly due to the immigrants, but I'm sure a lot of the born and bred Kiwis are eating a lot less lamb and beef. So those are the people who are gonna be taking part in referendums deciding whether you have the social license to farm or not. So um, those are the cons. Outgoing chief scientist advisor Sir Peter Gluckman just a day or two ago, you might have heard there's no significant ecological or health concerns related to genetically modified organisms. And he wasn't specifically talking about gene editing, he was talking about GMOs as well as gene editing. And gene editing, as I said, is much more controlled than uh, than the old transgenic and isogenic approaches of GMOs. So the other issue is whether X may be adversely affected, and LIC has had the problem whenever they want to do it that Fonterra has been very vocal, saying it will opportunities. So if we look at the situation, New Zealand might allow gene editing or might forbid editing. 
and uh, other countries might allow gene editing or forbid gene editing. And I've said right now for the status quo, as far as allowing gene edited animals through the food chain, it's pretty much forbidden both in New Zealand and by our competitors. But I think that's going to change. And, uh, and what we're going to see is a competitive disadvantage if it is forbidden in New Zealand but allowed by our competitors. And I think it's going to be allowed by our competitors if for no other reason because it cannot be traced. So the question we have is really whether we want to move in that space where we allow it or whether we're going to stay in that space where we forbid it. So there are some practical issues. How do we find the gene editing targets? And we really have to do that by genotyping and genomic prediction. So all the work we've done in the dairy industry, it's from having lots of genotypes and having industry databases that allows us to find the regions that would be of interest. Um, there's a question about who will do it. There's a question about who will pay for it. It's beyond the reach of the family farmer to do it, both in terms of the cash and in terms of the ideas. Uh, there are some risks associated with testing it and validating it. And there's a question about who will benefit from it. So conclusion, it offers opportunities for quantum leaps in primary production in terms of health, welfare, productivity, and environmental stewardship. It is going to be adopted for gene therapy and personalized medicine. It's not detectable, so it's impossible to prevent unless international trade in germplasm is eliminated. It will be adopted in primary production in some other countries to which we export or which we compete with in the global market. And New Zealand will be globally disadvantaged until we are allowed, encouraged and funded to undertake gene editing research. Thank you.